Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us on our third um, online lecture for Vets Cymru in 2021. Um, of course, we'd just love to be there by the sea doing this live, but um, this is the next best thing, and we'll be back next year um, in June. So we'll um, give you a heads up of that date at the end. Tonight, I'd like to introduce Emma Gerard. Emma Gerard is um, a highly experienced nurse and she is a diploma holder in advanced veterinary nursing, small animal, and she has a top-up degree in clinical nursing as well. Um, currently, amidst her many other um, roles in education and so forth, she is um, the Welsh Regions um, Chair in BSAVA and she's the first nurse in BSAVA to hold this position of chair. So um, without any further ado, I'd like to um, ask Emma to give us her talk this evening on infection control. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Kate. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. So tonight's topic is be an infection control champion. So the veterinary nurse's role in infection control and prevention. So let's just go to the next slide. So Infection control is a massive subject and we could easily take up several lectures within this topic. But what I've tried to do is focus on several aspects and key areas of infection control and the role of the infection control champion. So tonight we're going to cover what is infection control, infection control considerations, the com complications of infection control and the goals of infection control, along with biosecurity procedures and clinical audits. And then finally, sort of talking about the infection control champion and what your nurse's role would be in that. So infection control is the prevention of the spread of clinically significant microorganisms that can have the potential to um, spread pathogenic microorganisms and cause disease. So it can also be the process by which the healthcare facility, so in our instance, the veterinary setting, develop and implement specific policies and procedures to minimise the spread of infection amongst staff, patients and our owners as well. So infection control must be a consideration for the whole practice. All members of the team must be on board and understand the reasons why infection control programmes and policies are important. So this has to include everyone from the vets right down to admin staff and cleaners as well if we have them. And when considering infection control challenges, we know that they're very similar to those that have been faced in human healthcare. We're far less likely to wash our hands when we're busy and when wearing full PPE, I'm sure as we're all aware at the moment with COVID and our new regulations. And in general, human doctors are probably not as thorough in their hand hygiene as nurses. And this is likely to be the same for the veterinary team. We also know that there's the added risk of transmission of infectious agents between humans and animals and vice versa. And some of the hospital acquired infections that are commonly seen in humans like MRSA are now being seen in the veterinary hospital. And we actually had a case at work a couple of weeks ago uh, with a cat with non-healing wounds on its back legs. And it turned out that the owner had been in and out of hospital and obviously passed on MRSA to that cat. So it's really important to be asking our owners you know, their sort of current circumstances, um, you know, not being afraid to do that. Because obviously we have similar issues with multi-drug resistant infections and there's new things coming out all the time. Okay, so why should we take infection control seriously and why should we have um, protocols in place? So firstly, infectious complications are a significant contributor to morbidity and mortality. So our patients will either die or have to be euthanized because they develop an infectious complication. So the patient might not be suitable for further surgery or their owners might not be able to afford any treatment. Critical care and emergency patients are at a higher risk of developing infectious complications because they're more likely to have indwelling devices such as catheters um, or IV lines, central lines. And there's also the additional complication of direct intangible costs. So it will cost someone to treat the issue, and this might then have a negative impact on the business. So, for example, what would the owner say if they'd had a complication to friends? You've got word of mouth involved in this. And I'm sure you've all seen comments on social media, for example, from owners when something's not gone quite, quite to plan at their vet practice. 
And then finally, we've got multi-drug resistant infections. So they're really common in immune suppressed patients, but they can also affect our healthy patients coming into the practice. So by having infection control policies in place, this can avoid this happening. So what should our goals for our infection control protocols be? So firstly, we want to decrease the likelihood of exposing our patients to infectious agents. So for example, the zoonotic risks. We also want to maximize the staff participation in infection control activities. So as we said at the start, the whole team needs to be on board and understand how important infection control protocols are. And we also need to monitor that these are actually being carried out. So we need to carry out surveillance on our protocols. And then finally, we need to optimize the efficiency of our infection control procedures and policies. So we need to look at who will be reviewing the procedures and how often things will invariably change and someone within the team needs to be responsible for maintaining the infection control protocols. Okay, so every veterinary practice should have a documented infection control program. And at a minimum, this should be the collection of basic infection control policies and the accompanying SOPs that would then grow into the formal manual, which incorporates all the specific staff education, training, client education, the surveillance protocols and compliance um, programs as well. So the purpose of this collection of resources is to act as the resource that contains all the approved infection control protocols. So the manual should be updated as needed. So this could be in the form of minor additions or changes or a complete over uh, review. So and a revision that would then be term determined by the infection control champion. So the prospect of developing this or refining an existing infection control program is quite daunting, as many of us have never had any formal training. So I would suggest that this is done in a step-by-step -step approach, which we will talk about in a moment. So the manual should include all the key principles of infection control. And these are the things that I think are sort of most important, really. So hand hygiene, we've got environmental cleaning and disinfection, fomite consideration, surgical asepsis, antibiotic um, stewardship, so to do with your antimicrobial use, and then the appropriate use of isolation facilities. And we'll go on in a moment to discuss some of these. So a biosecurity procedure is a measure that should be considered from the moment any patient enters a practice. So the biosecurity policy should be developed and will include all the specific measures to the practice and that will minimise the risk of transmission of infectious diseases and then reduce the incidence of hospital acquired infections. So they could be from animal to animal, human to animal or animal to human. So what should we include in our biosecurity policy? Now, this will generally depend on the type of practice that you're in and it can be designed to suit your practice we're not all the same, we see different things, we have um, different risk factors, but generally speaking, it will include all the infection control principles and how um, these could be guided to develop our policies. So we want to optimise hand, or oh, sorry, hygiene, so generally hygiene with our standard precautions. So this would include your hand hygiene, the use of PPE, cleaning and disinfection, we need to make sure we understand the routes of transmission in order to break that transmission. And we need to use a targeted approach in our infection control procedures by using surveillance. And finally, we need to enhance education and awareness amongst our staff and pet owners. And it's really important not to um, sort of forget our owners. So disease transmission is one aspect of infection control and the strategy and protocols that we have in place, and these should be considered for every patient. So in order to effectively control and prevent the spread of disease in your practice, you need to understand the various routes that pathogens are transmitted. Um, infection control and prevention really does depend on the disruption of transmission of pathogens from their source. So that's either the infected animal or human or the new host or location. And there's three elements that are required for successful disease transmission. So that would be the source of infection. So this would either be the endogenous or exogenous sources. So your endogenous are the patient's own flora. 
and exogenous are the sources in the environment. So that could be the walls, the floors, your worktops, cages, bedding, um, equipment, that kind of thing. And then we have host, sus host susceptibility. So this um, is where the infection can vary greatly amongst the general population. So with increased susceptibility, it tends to be with the unvaccinated, the very young, the elderly, those that are immunosuppressed, so it could be pregnancy, or those with injuries that would allow a break in the normal defence mechanisms. So these patients should also be considered when designing your infection control protocols um, with highly sort of susceptible risks to infection. And then we've obviously got our routes of transmission. So the routes of transmission can be divided into five main routes. So we have direct contact, we have fomites, we have aerosol or airborne, we have oral ingestion, and then we have vector-borne. So in terms of biosecurity, it's really important to have a strategy to assess all your patients on the risk of infection. So I would suggest that you utilize a tiered system for classifying your patients based on their susceptibility to infection, the level of disease present, and also their clinical status. So this is really similar to organizing your surgical list by contamination level with the most susceptible and least infectious patients being dealt with first before your infectious patients. So this classification is made up of four tiers and it would provide you with a standardized approach and guides your staff to where patients should be kenneled and how they should be nursed. So that would include your levels of PPE. So we'll look at those now. So you've got tier one. So tier one patients are high risk for acquiring infections due to their poor immune status. So this would be, for example, your immunocompromised neonates or unvaccinated patients. And these should be dealt with before everybody else. We then have tier two patients that have no evidence of contagious disease at that particular time. So they tend to be generally well patients with no history of infectious disease. So it could be those that are remitted for an elective um, surgery or a workup. And these patients should be dealt with after your tier one patients to limit any disease transmission. We then have your tier three patients. So these are patients that have infectious diseases deemed to be mildly or moderately contagious to other patients or personnel, so your staff. So this could be MRSA or an FELV, FIV patient, for example. And then finally, we've got tier four patients. So these are patients that are known or suspected to have a highly contagious disease. So that could be parvovirus, distemper, salmonella, leptospirosis, those kind of things. So the zoonotic risk. So they must be housed in isolation until they're discharged. So if we can categorise patients when they're presented to the practice in one of these tiers, it means that all your staff will know just by looking at the hospital sheets what tier they're in. And then that will then determine the order that we handle them in and what their infection risk is. Right, so we'll talk about hand hygiene now. So this is a core element of infection prevention and cold, um, control. So hands are the main pathway in germ tra transmission and is the most important aspect to avoid cross-contamination. So hand hygiene substantially reduces potential pathogens on your hands and studies have shown that regular hand washing will significantly reduce the risk of nosocomial infections. So hand washing removes dirt, organic matter, most microorganisms that are acquired through direct contact with your patient and also from the environment. So they must be washed using soap and water when they're visibly dirty or visibly soiled with blood and other, other bodily fluids. And the WHO guide to hand hygiene is the recommended framework to use within veterinary practice. And I'm sure most of you will, all, all of you should be familiar with that. So it's an evidence-based, field-tested, user-centered approach that's really easy to learn, logical and applicable to a range of healthcare settings. So it's the one that we, we all should be using. And hand hygiene observations and audits are recommended to ensure that compliance is maintained. We've got hand rubbing, so obviously there's a difference between the two. So alcohol-based hand rubs with a minimum content of 60% alcohol offer a practical and acceptable alternative to hand washing in most situations. 
So unless um, hands are visibly soiled, you can use an alcohol-based rub, um, and it's actually preferred over soap and water in most clinical situations. And this is down to evidence of better compliance compared to soap and water. So if you think about it, you're not just necessarily going to go and sort of wash your hands um, if you're dealing with your kennels, you're, you're impatient. So it's easy to have an alcohol hand rub, obviously making sure that they're not visibly soiled. And then we've got the five moments of hand hygiene. So this is based on substantial evidence from the World Health Organization, and it's designed to minimize the risk of transmission of microorganisms between you, the healthcare worker, the patient and the environment. So the five moments of hand hygiene defines the key moments when we should be performing hand hygiene. So this approach recommends that we're cleaning our hands before we touch a patient, so before we even go anywhere near it, before a clean aseptic procedure, so that could be placing an IV catheter, a urinary catheter, um, after body fluid exposure, after touching a patient, and after touching the patient's surroundings. So as well as hand washing technique, consideration to the use of PPE is really important as well. So it provides a barrier between you and the exposure risk and the appropriate use helps to prevent the spread of pathogens between your patients and the environment. So it is actually considered, considered a relatively less effective means of controlling exposure because it relies on the human factors. So staff compliance of using it and obviously having the appropriate education and training on how to use it appropriately. Although it is a less effective means to prevent infection, we should still be using it when it's indicated. Um, gloves reduce the risk of pathogen transmission by providing a barrier protection. So they've got to be worn when you're in contact with blood, body fluids, secretions, excretions, and the mucous membranes. And they should also be worn when you're cleaning kennels and environmental surfaces, as well as doing the laundry if there's gross contamination present. And it's really important to remove your gloves promptly after use whilst avoiding contact with your skin and the outer glove surface and any touch surfaces by the ungloved hand. So if you remove any gloves inappropriately, then you're then touching the environment and then you've got a contamination risk there. So it's worth just considering and, and looking at everyone else and how they're taking their gloves off. So a study by Okamoto and his colleagues in 2019 actually found that 39% of workers made errors in removing their PPE. So that included gowns and gloves. And this then increased the incidence of contamination. So this study, for me, provides evidence that warrants the use of hand hygiene auditing. OK, so evaluation and repeated monitoring of a range of indicators reflecting hand hygiene practices and um, compliance is a really vital component of any successful hand hygiene campaign. So training uh, of all the practice staff is imperative to ensure that everybody is aware of the occasions when hand hygiene should be performed. So obviously thinking about hand rubs, hand washing, five moments of hand hygiene, and that will give you an indication of when we should be using it. And auditing of hand hygiene is also really useful to um, the infection control policy. So it's a really useful addition to have. So it can be achieved by direct or indirect observation. So you could obviously let people know that you were doing it or you could just walk past and, and just obviously observe what they're doing. And the World Health Organization have developed a hand hygiene self assessment framework, which can be used in the veterinary facility to assess hand hygiene practices. So it's just something to be aware of. Okay, so we'll talk now about environmental hygiene. So all areas of a practice, so whether that be clinical or non-clinical, should be assessed according to the risk of infection determined by the levels of cleaning required. So think about high and low level areas. So your um, consulting rooms and waiting rooms have high levels of patients. So they're going to be different to your operating theatre, which is a potentially sterile area. It will then be different to your intermediate areas, which would be your kennel areas. And obviously you would need a high risk um, protocol for your isolation so it's just something to think about look at your areas and think what's the highest risk and then assess it so doing a floor plan can be really helpful and just color code um, to see what your high and low risks are 
So there should be a standardized process, if possible, with one disinfectant and one dilution. So it's no good having several disinfectants that could potentially do the same thing. It just confuses people. And they should have a really easy written protocol um, with cleaning schedules, with evidence of a review and update uh, at regular intervals. So we really need to be providing the appropriate training at induction for your new members of staff and also reviewing your old members of staff as well. So environmental cleaning um, should obviously be, you should be training everyone on how we're doing it and protocols should be readily available for reference. Using checklists are really useful to establish routine intervals and compliance. Obviously, just making sure that people are actually doing the jobs that they're supposed to do and not just ticking the tick sheet, which obviously isn't what we want. And then monitoring your efficacy of environmental cleaning. So using your surveillance methods, so swab cultures, surface hygiene monitoring, uh, monitoring with ATP, um, fluorescent markers, that kind of thing. It may seem daft having this in here, but I think people get confused with cleaning and disinfection. And there is a really big difference between the two. And we need to be doing them properly to make sure we're effective in our environmental hygiene. So cleaning is the process of removing unwanted substances. So for example, dirt, infectious agents and other impurities from an object or an environment. And it works by detergent and water to physically remove germs from all your surfaces. It doesn't necessarily kill germs, but it will lower their numbers, which is when, when our disinfection comes in. So disinfection is the process by eliminating microorganisms from a contaminated surface. So that could be your skin, your instruments, your kennels, um, by the use of a, a use of a physical or chemical means. So disinfection is the process to reduce the number of microorganisms to a level that's not harmful to health. So it will disinfecting will kill germs on the surfaces and objects. And it really is a three-step process. So the first is to mechanically remove all your organic material. So whether that be feces, blood, urine, um, respiratory secretions or dirt in general. So during cleaning, organic debris must be removed, otherwise it will inactivate your disinfectant and protect the organisms. So step two, we should be cleaning the surface with a detergent. So this will actually decrease your contamination by at least 90%. And then we can use our suitable disinfectant afterwards, rinse and dry. Um, so once the surface is clean and dry, we then apply our disinfectant at the correct dilution, obviously depending on your manufacturer's guidelines, allow it to sit for required contact time. So there's no good just spraying and then wiping down. It needs to have that contact time. So whether that be five or 10 minutes, and then we need to rinse away the disinfectant with a damp cloth and dry the area well. So cleaning and disinfection has a number of key factors. So we need to remember that using a disinfection is not a substitute for cleaning. We need to be wearing our PPE and organic matter must be removed. It's vital that all our staff are trained on cleaning and disinfectant protocols, including how to disinfect, make up your disinfectant, sorry, and obviously check your contact times. And the best cleaning and disinfectant protocols are those that are effective, but also really easy to understand and execute. We need to make sure that your staff are trained on disinfection and provide them with the supplies that they need when and where. So colour coded items, make sure you've got separate ones for your theatre, your kennels, reception areas, that kind of thing. So we'll just look at the patient considerations now as a whole. So in developing cleaning and disinfection protocols for patient areas, you need to consider the following. So fine fomites, so high touch sites within the environment and shared equipment. We should be keeping our surface, surfaces uncluttered. So that is really to stop biofilms um, forming. Um, so they protect bugs and microorganisms and it makes it difficult for them to um, be killed. And as I said before, cleaning equipment, so color coding that. So it needs to be fit for purpose. If it's not right, then replace it. Obviously clean it regularly. So get your mop buckets cleaned, mop heads, take them off, pop them in the washing machine. Um, so we're not spreading the germs everywhere. Consider your laundry protocols. So we should all really be doing or using industrial washing machines and obviously in practice, we tend to just have the normal standard ones that we have at home. 
um, and not always up to scratch. And we also need to make sure that we're washing at 60 degrees for at least 10 minutes. And we really ought to be um, tumble drying as well. And I know it's not good for the environment, but it will just make sure that your bio burden from any infection is killed off completely. It's also important to make sure that we're separating our theatre attire and not bunging that all in with our dirty bedding. Okay, so have separate washers, separate machines are ideal if we can. Staff uniforms, it is good practice to come into work in your normal civvies and then change into your scrubs or your uniform at home. So you've obviously got the risk of contamination from home into work and, and, and obviously going back home. So we should be changing on arrival and when we're leaving. Utilising your cleaning checklist, as we said before, having your tick charts for your deep cleans and your daily cleans. PPE. Obviously, I've said that it's a least effective measure, but it's still really important because it has a barrier between staff and the exposure risk and it, it needs to be used appropriately, um, obviously, to prevent the spread of pathogens between animals and the environment. And then we also have our isolation protocols. So barrier nursing obviously prevents transmission of diseases from staff and from patient to patient. We have to understand the infectious diseases that we're seeing and their transmission in order to put effective protocols in place. So this is where we're talking about our tiered system. So both tier one, you're immunocompromised and tier four, you're infectious, need to be incorporated in this. I just wanted to draw your attention to this. So this is um, talking about fomites. So consideration has to be made to our fomites. Um, handheld devices are really popular and we all have them. We all have our mobile phones. We've all got our apps on them. I'm as guilty as the next person. We've got your formulary and whatever else and your calculator on there. But they really do pose a serious risk. So a new study it, um, has actually found that 68% of our portable electronic devices used by veterinary staff were contaminated with staphylococci, including some resistant strains. So the results indicated that 96% of staff with a PED, which are used within the hospital environment, of 85% use their device every day. So that's a huge amount. And despite obviously the high usage of PEDs in the hospital environment, only 6% of staff were actually cleaning their device daily, um, with 33% of staff cleaning it less than weekly. And then furthermore to that, 54% of staff cleaned their device with a disinfectant so that's half they're actually cleaning it so this study demonstrates that the use of portable electronic devices can become contaminated with potentially pathogenic microorganisms and although, although this study didn't focus on the transmission of these microorganisms it's quite unclear as to whether the clinical implications um, what, the, what the clinical implications are. But I would say it's quite prudent to develop the appropriate protocols for cleaning of our mobile phones and iPads and things like that within the Bentley Hospital. Um, so how many of us are obviously using it and cleaning it? So it's just something to think about. And we'll talk briefly about theatre attire. So there's limited evidence that non-sterile theatre wear actively contributes to the reduction in surgical site infection rates, but who actually state that it's good practice to utilise theatre attire, so it's, it's good practice, it just means that we, we remember where we are if we're using it. Um, footwear, so should be non-slip, enclosed and um, suitable for disinfection, okay, obviously popping them in the um, washing machine if we can, if we've got Crocs. Um, the infection risk from floor bacteria is relatively small, but there um, is little evidence to support, or there is little evidence to support, um, sorry, I'll start again. There is little evidence to support the benefit of wearing theatre shoes, but it really does instill good theatre practice, and it can help to reduce the transference of particulate matter from outside the theatre into theatre. Think about your cleaning routine, so the start of the day, the end of the day, and between the procedures. And we also need to think about the protocols for managing potentially infected cases. So when are we going to do those? Obviously, think about your emergency cases and cleaning down. Whether if we have an infected case that is an emergency, then we need to do a deep clean before we um, use that. Or if you've got an additional theatre that you can use, close that one down. So it's just making consideration to that. <clears throat> 
surgical safety checklists. So ensuring that your sterile surgical environment is um, making, ensuring your sterile environment is essential part of um, surgical safety. So we need to think about our um, aseptic techniques, so how our surgeons are behaving. We need to think about the sterility of our equipment and the environment as well. We also need to limit non-essential traffic in the theatre area. So how many times have we had someone just pop in with a coffee for a chat when in the middle of a bitch bay? It's not ideal. So it's just trying to train people up just to make sure they understand that it's a sterile environment. Again, this is a topic that's huge and we could have a webinar all by itself on um, skin preparation. But there's just some key points to consider when you are preparing your patients, just to help prevent SSIs if we can see surgical site infections. So for me, it's generally a three stage process with the first stage being your clipping. So we should be clipping with a clean, undamaged clipper blades with wide margins, taking care to avoid clipper rash. We should be vacuum, vacuuming hair, so hoovering it away, using lint rollers if you like as well. They're quite useful to get those last stubborn bits of hair out. And bandaging your distal limbs with cohesive bandage if you need to, so we haven't got a dirty foot in the way. Then we've got the initial preparation. So we've got 50-50 dilution chlorhex and water. Now put a bit of a star by this because there is a study in the veterinary nurse journal that has shown there's evidence of chlorhex resistance. So if you look on the side of your hippie scrub, it will actually tell you that we shouldn't be diluting it. So the manufacturer's guidelines state that we should be using it neat. So why are we diluting it and, and should we be diluting it? So it's obviously just stems back to somewhere with our head nurses when we were training that we always dilute 50-50. But should we really be doing that? Again, it's something to think about. It's a messy job if you're using it neat. Maybe explore it a little bit and see how you get on. Um, we should be using the back and forth motion as well. There's evidence in human and um, you know some evidence coming through in the veterinary side that we should be using the back and forth rather than the circle. Then obviously sterile drape and transfer into your theatre if you have the luxury of having a separate prep and theatre. And then we've got the stage three. So this is your final prep. Again, I've starred Chlorhex 50-50. Um, the gold standard is to be using 70% alcohol and 2% chlorhex. Um, so obviously I've put the name of it there. Some of you may already be using that. We shouldn't really be using spray bottles because there's evidence of contamination with pseudomonas. And there's no real evidence to be using surgical spirit. Um, so why do we? Again, it's just one of those things that we've just been taught to do. But if we haven't got evidence for doing it, then we should, we should stop doing it really, shouldn't we? And also not forgetting about disinfecting and changing your toothbrushes as well and making sure that we're clean in between patients with our clippers. So um, how many times a day are we using the same toothbrush to clean our clippers? And then obviously then that contamination is going on ready for our next patient. Again, something just to think about. Okay, so we'll talk now about antiseptics. So this is something to, again, to be aware of, that antiseptics can be contaminated and become a source of an infectious outbreak. This can then cause you an issue with a surgical site infection and wound breakdowns. So this was a study by Wong and his colleagues, or her colleagues, in 2018, and they found that several cats with non-healing wounds were infected with a bacteria that had been contaminated within the surgical scrub. So five were found during this study, two had to be euthanized, but the likelihood is there were a lot more patients that they weren't aware of. So at some point, someone has accidentally contaminated that main scrub bottle, which has then seeded patients with this contaminant. So it's a really bad idea to take your main bottle and keep refilling um, your little bottles. And how many times do we do that? You've got a little bit in the bottom, you just fill it up. What we need to do is wait till it's either all completely gone or just tip that away, wash it out, clean it, then refill. You've got the risks of biofilms contaminating your scrub bottles. Okay, so we should have a SOP in place to ensure the sterility of our antiseptic bottles. Now we'll just talk a little bit about clinical audits. So this is a process that we use to assess, evaluate and reflect on the effectiveness of our procedures in a systematic way in order to improve our patient care and then outcomes. 
So they should be used as part of a continuous quality improvement process, which focuses on a specific issue or aspect of clinical practice. So it could be surgical prep, um, it could be how you're placing your catheters, your IV catheters. So the um, process involves you selecting a specific area of clinical practice, collecting data on it, comparing it with best practice and evidence-based research in order to then make a decision on whether your protocols are reaching the correct standard or whether we need to make modifications for that. Okay. So clinical audits, as I say, are a useful tool to check the effectiveness and adherence of your infection control gu guidelines, and they should be utilised for your infection control programs. So hygiene, uh, audits can include your hand hygiene observation, which, which we talked about earlier on, post-op surgical wound care. So if you're doing your vet audits or um, you know, monitoring all your post-op, so um, your routine um, neuters and anything more complicated, doing the ATP environmental monitoring, monitoring or your fluorescent markers. So your fluorescent markers are really useful. So you would, use the fluorescent markers and mark a few areas, for example, in your prep rooms of the table. And then what you would do is get someone to go and clean that. And then you'd come in with a little torch, UV torch, and it would highlight any areas that, that have been missed. So it's something that's really useful to utilize. And your audits will quickly identify any compliance issues or an outbreak of hospital acquired infections. And it will then enable you to localize that outbreak to a specific routine or member of staff. And it's important not to go and point the finger, just to assess what's going wrong and then come up with a plan. So get everybody involved, no finger pointing, it's not gonna help. Um, infection control audits can be used as evidence for your RCBS practice standard scheme under clinical governance. Um, so if you are a hospital um, within your RCBS practice standards, then we should be doing those anyway. And then this slide will show you the steps that are required to develop and optimize your infection control program. So it's an incremental approach that will develop and refine, and it should be done in a step-by-step -step process that's practical, economical, and effective for you. So the steps required to develop an infection control program are to identify your member of staff to oversee and develop the implementation. So that would be your infection control um, champion. Identify and develop your protocols and checklists. Perform an infection control assessment and develop a staff education and training program, collect client education materials, so whether that be for worming, your preventative healthcare, your vaccination, raw fed patients, develop and implement your surveillance program, and then establish and maintain a compliance evaluation program. So now we'll talk about the role of the infection control champion. So we've talked about some of the key elements of infection control, but someone really needs to be responsible for the biosecurity policies and the procedures. And in my opinion, nurses are often best placed to take on this role. So in order to develop and optimize the key steps of infection control, the veterinary practice will have to have one specific person to coordinate the formal infection control program. So we need to empower someone within your team. And the infection control champion will develop your um, evidence-based policies and procedures for your biosecurity plans. They will manage the implementation of procedures to ensure compliance. They will ensure that the protocols are being followed. And they will act as a resource as well. So coming to you to obviously gain information. They will also provide training, so ensuring proper training to um, new employees and obviously the ones that you already have. So everyone needs to be reviewing that. You will also report on group activities to the rest of the practice and direct and interpret surveillance plans. And you'll communicate with your staff regarding infection control issues and ensure that they are reviewed and checked for effectiveness. So it's not a position that needs to be filled by an expert in infection control. It, or, you know, we don't really get training in this, do we? So for me, the key requirement is someone that has an interest in infection control. 
So you need to develop staff expertise in biosecurity with the information and education and the championing for infection control within the practice. So we're encouraging everyone to take responsibility for it. It's not just down to one person, it's a whole team approach. And we've got review and check effectiveness there on the end. Okay, so you might now be wondering where you should start. So the first thing we need to do is assess how you're doing as a whole. So we need to measure our infection control protocols. And one way to do this is by using the AAHA practice biosecurity tracker. So this assessment tool is a really useful place to start as it's a simple way to assess your strengths and weaknesses and identify where time should be spent on developing your protocols and making them better, so improving them. Now, when you go onto it, it asks you if you're fully implementing, partially implementing or not implementing a range of infection control strategies. And after you've answered all your questions, you'll then be able to review and print your report and assign tactics that need implementation or completion by you and your team. And it also shows you what you're doing well. So this assessment gives you a target and actions items that identifies your strengths and weaknesses. And it's really important to highlight those strengths. And it's important to continue with your periodic assessments to benchmark your successes and achievements because tracking progress will keep the staff motivated and prevent that compliance from tapering off. So you will, without doubt, experience barriers in your implementations. So how can we motivate change? And I think this is probably the most challenging thing. Um, challenge, uh, changes in a practice making changes in a practice is really hard so for example if you created an SOP you want everyone to change to that but in reality that's just not going to happen and getting long-term change is difficult because practices and team members will often revert back to baseline however there is some science behind getting people to change now most people are really reluctant to change their attitudes regarding the best approach or to shift their outlook and reframe their goals and educational components by themselves don't generally work. And it isn't really just about giving people the information. It's about getting attitudes to change so that we can make an impact on an individual. So then we can make our bigger changes in practice. Um, attitude changes really occur gradually. So it could be weeks, months, um, sometimes years before we can do that. It also tends to happen through meaningful, non-forceful clinical discussions, for example, about viewpoints. And the more an individual is allowed to slowly revise their views and arrive at a new outlook, the more effective the attempt at the attitude change will typically be. So we need to get individuals to buy into infection control so they align their attitudes and behaviours. Now, this can be done using the compliance tactics. So that's um, the foot in the door technique, for example. So this aims to get someone to agree to a large request by having them do a smaller, more modest request. So initially you make a small request and once that person takes it on and agrees to do it, it's more difficult for them to refuse to do the bigger one. And remember, it's OK to ask for small changes and to look for small improvements. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. We've got to start small. So in summary, infection control is a team effort, but the infection control champion should be the driving force. Um, creating and optimising the infection control programme can be accomplished with little expense, time, and it will have a far reaching benefit for your staff, patients and client health. Um, you should use your time and resources to effectively concentrate on the key moments of infection control. So obviously the things that we've talked about and getting the team to change ineffective or concerning infection control related behaviours is really challenging. So utilise your leverage techniques and behaviour change science in order to be successful with compliance. Small changes make a really big difference. And then periodic assessments of your infection control program takes little time. Um, they're a really important motivator for personnel um, compliance. Don't forget to highlight your successes. It's really important. And that is it. So thank you for listening. Fewer infections means more time for snuggling. So infection prevention and control is good for everybody. And then there's a list of references if anyone wants anything then just pop it in the chat box and i'm happy to send the presentation or um 
any of the references for you, you're more than welcome to, to pop that in and we can do that for you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, there was a lot there. That was a, a really packed session. And, um, I think there was a lot to sort of take on and also um, probably everybody needs to go home and have a really good like look at their notes and, and uh, um, probably come up with questions in retrospect. We're open for questions now and if anybody's got any questions, uh, please pop them in the uh, Q&A now and uh, Emma will, I'm sure, be able to tackle those um, readily for you. Um, just to remind everybody, this is going to be available as a recording. Um, so Emma said she'd be happy to, to provide the presentation, but also it will be available on the BSIBA website as a recording. And it will be available within about 48 hours of, of this um, live session. Um, also, um, please do put in your diaries that Vets Cymru hopes to be back live in 2022. And the date is um, June 17th and 18th. So Friday and Saturday again as we did in 2019. Um, so uh, thank you, Denise. Denise has just said, very interesting and informative talk, Emma. Thank you, I agree. Um, there was a lot there. Emma, can I ask you a question whilst we're waiting to see if anybody else can? Yeah. Really um, do you think it's effective to, to have one person on the nursing team or perhaps maybe all of the nursing team buying in as, you know, a sort of a part champion each do you think that's something definitely that... you could have an infection control group which is even more effective so it's not just down to one person and I think it's actually quite good to have some of the vets involved as well you know have a vet a nurse and a receptionist um you know practice manager involved and have an infection control group I think you're going to get better compliance and better protocols by doing that no I think um you mentioned something really interesting reception staff because receptionists are often, it's it's a little bit more difficult now with COVID, but you know they're often sort of the front line, aren't they, in terms of um, communicating with the client, you know, exchange of potential, I suppose, phone lines equipment there with uh, credit cards and all the rest. Yeah. Um, so yeah, actually, for them to have a buy into this, they're often the parts of the staff team that get forgotten about when we talk about infection control. So um, glad to mention that. Um, Sarah's asking, how often would you swap swab areas um, of interest? You know, you were talking about sort of a monitor. Yeah, it's an interesting question because I was always led to believe that you should sort of do it quarterly. That's what I always did. But it's quite costly to do that. And I think there's a what it's changing now. I think only do it if there's a problem. So if you're noticing a problem, then I would suggest doing your swabs and seeing if anything comes back. And then you can adjust your protocols so whether that be cleaning or your you know your surgical prep that kind of thing so there's monitoring for post-op infections primarily to start with and then um, if you start getting some of those coming through definitely record of that i presume yeah so it's really easy to do it on your practice management system so you can have a, a post-op graded so you know one to four so it doesn't need any drugs was fine needed you know, something needed surgical intervention, needed medical intervention, and then you can go back every month and just review them. And then you, you'll find that obviously a lot of them will be self-induced trauma. So then you can try and implement your busted collars, your pet medical shirts, that kind of thing. Obviously, compliance with owners is the key with that. Um, but you can also pick up the surgical issues, which touch wood, I don't really think is an issue, really. You mentioned about clippers and um... That's a bit of a pet bugbear of mine, I guess. Do you do you think that prep rooms should have dedicated clippers for different parts of the prep room? So I guess the op room clippers shouldn't be the ones that are used to, you know, the urinal gland bum or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Oh, abscesses. Yeah, without a doubt, you should have separate clippers. And working in a mixed practice, it's not easy because you get your farm vets coming and grabbing to go and take them out to do something. So yeah, if you can, definitely have separate. Or, you know, keeping an eye on your blades and changing your um, um, toothbrushes if you're cleaning utensils really helps as well. Yeah. Is that something, I mean, those toothbrushes, is it worth sort of having a routine for um, autoclaving those? Is that a bit over the top on a daily basis or just sort of sticking them in some chlorhexidine? I'm a bit worried about what you were saying about chlorhexidine growing its own bugs. Yeah, it's just something to think about. It's just a way of obviously making sure you're not contaminating. So do you mean sort of um, sterilising or autoclaving your clipper blades or 
blades or the toothbrushes that you use to clean them you know you were saying about yeah just chuck them because I don't know if they would stand up to even on a 121 whether we'd melt our brushes um not sure about that but I think chuck them every week so making sure that you're disinfecting those every um certainly every day and making sure that after use they're being obviously checked and then just throw them away at the end of the week well I know it's not very sustainable uh, which we're obviously trying to be but they're quite cheap and even go for the bamboo ones and then at least it's it's not so wasteful yeah yeah good point okay yeah um and, and gloves you know you were talking about gloves um do we I suppose we could very easily overuse gloves and over depend on gloves do you think because you mentioned a lot about hand washing there is that much more yeah I think so I think it's making sure we're using them for the right thing so wounds definitely get them on because it's not just about protecting you and the patient well, it's protecting you and the patient so obviously we don't want to spread out bugs to our patient and we don't want to pick up anything I think it's using it in the right um, time isn't it so wounds definitely surgical prep we should be doing it um, yeah urinary catheters that kind of thing um, if you can obviously if you're doing your routine checks and things just use your um, alcohol rubs and, it, and otherwise wash your hands between each patient mm -hmm. but then your compliance is down because how often are you in kennels and going round and then you haven't got sink there and you're just going from one patient to the other aren't you it's difficult so it is part of the um, it's part of the protocol for practice standards, isn't it, to have um, a sink at least in all your kennel areas and all your, your prep areas, and consulting areas. Um, so yeah, I guess a lot to take on. You're, you you mentioned just at the end um, about where to start. You know, say you want to figure out where to start and you want to gather some information to start with, and you showed us um, a reference there. Is that something that's easy to find? So which one? So with those, so there is loads that you can find on the AHA, A, I can never say it. The AAHA guidelines are amazing. You will find all sorts of bits and bobs there. It's got all the stuff about infection control champions. It's got your um, assessment tool. So I would definitely go and utilize that. You've also got the Bella Moss Foundation as well, which has really useful things. It's got um, things that you can print out to pop on your walls about what you should be cleaning and high and low risk areas. It's also got a practice assessment on there as well, which might be a little bit easier than the um, AAHA one. So yeah, I think definitely to start off with, I would do the assessment and then that will give you an indication to where you can start. Start small. So find something that perhaps you just need to improve and focus on that before moving on to the next thing. Brilliant. That's fantastic, Emma. I think that's all the questions. Yeah. That's everything. Brilliant. Yeah. I think we should maybe let you have a bit of a rest now. Okay. It is a massive topic and we could talk about each thing individually. So yeah, I hope it covered enough and in enough detail and not too much. You know, you, you'll, you will have inspired um, those of us who've attended and anybody who's going to watch the recording. So fantastic uh, resource to have available there. Good. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Good night. Yeah, good night, everyone. Thank you.